Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I uh, thought I'd sit down and do another video for you guys. You got a sip of water? If you guys forearm shot. Alright, let's talk about this. You know, as we've been talking about these topics lately about size versus strength, more and more studies have come out looking at this, observational studies looking at these things. Um, and when I say that you cannot separate size and strength, what I mean is muscle growth, muscle tissue, myofibular growth, or hypertrophy of the contractile fibers of your muscles. The data, the data that's coming out more and more and more that at the tendon level, it may be as much as 100% of your strength. For a while, the data we were saying, look, you know, about 90% accounting for some different factors, meaning because we were looking at levers and moment arms. More of the studies that are coming out, if you guys are digging into them, they're starting to find now that increased cross-sectional area of the contractile fibers of your muscles are responsible for possibly as much as 100%. It could be as low as 90%, right? Could be as low as 90%, but it also could be 100% of your strength at the tendon level when your muscle contracts of what happens at the tendon okay now other strength disparities beyond that when you're like well this guy the size versus strength isn't isn't there has to do with other factors outside of that okay so keep that in mind but we're talking about at the tendon level for the individual muscle size and strength as long as we're talking about again the tissue hypertrophy of the contractile tissue, the cross-sectional area increases are a potentially the only real variable in determining strength production. So we come over to the question of why is there the confusion of size versus strength? Okay, uh, number one, obviously, moment arms, lever lengths, okay? How long your arms and legs are how long of a moment arm you're working against in other words even even an inch of forearm i have fairly long forearms your strict curl is going to be weaker with the same amount of bicep okay than someone with a shorter arm like this this one's obvious but it applies to all your big lifts too all right leverages so your leverages and moment arms are a big factor a smaller one could be where the tendon inserts can affect that Okay, those are factors. So you have that. Then you have the whole, well, how come you got this bodybuilder? But bodybuilders are strong. Okay, in other words, you guys will see these bodybuilders using lots and lots and lots of stuff who are massive and people are like, but they're moving light weights till you see them move a heavy weight. Okay. Uh, Till you see them put a, a heavy weight on a barbell and ask them to bench it. Or, you know, even an incline. How often have you seen a jack bodybuilder, when they're put to the test, they put 405 on an incline and rep it? Yeah. I promise you most guys on an Olympia lineup can do that. They are strong. You make them actually squat the weight, brace and everything and squat. How many of those guys can squat 600 for reps? if they're put on the spot and have to. They are strong. They just choose not to display it and they choose a different training style to go there and they can get away with that with what they're doing with all the stuff and everything. Uh, that's a factor. Number two, what people are missing is the appearance of size is not the same as size. All right. Uh, you'll see that all the time. I've seen that before all the time. Well, these strong men or this, this big power lift, you didn't look that big compared to these bodybuilders too. You see them next to them and then you realize a few things. Number one, the proportions. Bodybuilders work their show muscles usually a bit more than strength athletes, right? They work the show muscles more. They use sight enhancement in the show muscles more. That's one that people forget about. That also is a disparity between size and strength. Obviously, sight enhancement doesn't make you stronger, but it's also not muscle growth. Okay, let's state that again. Sight enhancement 
makes you bigger, makes the muscle look bigger. I mean, technically, if you were to put an air pump in a muscle and pump it up, it would be the muscle would be bigger in diameter. Doesn't mean the muscle fibers grew. So it's the same with a lot of the sight enhancement and people are forgetting these guys aren't just using a couple little tiny bit. Most of your serious high level bodybuilders have inches of it. Right? Without that there, a lot of them would have two, three, four inches less arm diameter. Right? And it's in everything. You saw guys it's even in their lats of the guys of the Olympia this year. You can see the swollen amounts there or swollen from it. It's everywhere. So that's a factor. The leanness is a factor. You know, everyone looks at that and goes, well, that big strength athlete, you know, he's, he's, why is he so much stronger than that bodybuilder who looks bigger to you realize that bodybuilder is a lean 270? And that strength athlete's 380 pounds. And then you realize, well, he doesn't have 100 pounds of, 110 pounds of fat on him. I bet he only has 50 pounds of fat on that bodybuilder. Maybe 70 pounds more fat than that bodybuilder, but he's 110 pounds heavier. What do you think that other weight is? And how much of it is in his go? How much of it is in his glutes and his quads? Okay, that's why he's stronger. Then we have the transient storage factors. This is another one that the best researchers have brought up. You've seen a lot of that. There's a difference potentially between sarcoplasmic and myofibular growth, meaning the the which will give lower technically lower quality musculature. Uh, it's been said by quite quite a few researchers and experts that people who have more myofibular versus sarcoplasmic they do look harder when they get they diet down. Okay, there's that, and then keep in mind a lot of the training that a lot of bodybuilders do isn't muscle growth. So there's also a lot of transient storage factors, stuff that will fade really fast. So some of the pump work that they're doing and the amounts they're doing, particularly with some of the things they take on top of it, is causing more glycogen storage in muscles. Okay? That's temporary. That actually goes away fast. Whereas in the true, myofibular growth is very long lasting. Myofibular growth can stay sometimes years after you quit lifting. So let's be clear on that. Some of that can be semi-permanent. Meaning a lot of your myofibular growth, if you've gotten really big and strong and jacked, a lot of that, that growth stays even if you don't touch a weight for a year. You'll lose some of it. You'll keep a lot of that. Those other things fade really fast. Sometimes they can fade within two weeks. So the guys who get do a lot of the really high pump work and they, they and again, they carve up for all of it, that glycogen storage, that can go away within a couple of weeks. It can be completely gone. Even if you've been doing it for three years straight and you quit doing that, then it goes, oh, I got all flat. Well, yeah, your muscles are holding less glycogen now. That's it. You've been training them to hold glycogen. That's, but that's temporary. It comes fast and it goes away fast. It can also be regained quickly. Um, so usually when guys are like, oh, I didn't get to the gym or I've detrained, that's, that's what you're seeing different. That's what they're losing. Okay. So understand the difference. So when it comes down to the fundamental tissue level of actual real contractile tissue growth, there isn't a difference between size and strength. There's other factors, but then also the thing that people are forgetting, there's the coordination and neural drive. So that's talking about the strength of a muscle here, especially on a small movement, a single joint movement locked in. On a big movement, there's also coordination, right? There is coordination. In other words, if you've built every individual muscle in a squat separately with small movements, your strength potential may be high, but until you learn to move your body and contract multiple muscles at the same time, you still won't be able to perform, okay? So there's that factor as well. Um, so again, that is, that is kind of an important and relevant topic when it does come to strength, is, is the skill component. And the skill has to do with the ability to use your body, to actually recruit those muscles coordinated with each other. So that's a factor as well. But when it comes to the, the actual just raw root strength that you're capable of producing, barring your individual leverages, it really is just a, it is a matter of muscle growth. And the, the data that has been confirming this as the equipment and measurements have gotten better has gone up. Like it has gone more and more in that direction to where some of the newer studies are saying um, that kind of seems to possibly be, might be actually be the only fruit factor, the only measurable one.
All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I'll talk to you guys next time.